the OSI model. <laughs> yes, that's what we're going to be talking about today. On today's video, I'll just help you break down this complex term, this complex world of networking. And I'll break down OSI model. And what does that mean, actually? What does that even mean? OSI model. It means Open Systems Interconnection Model. Yes. So sit back, grab your coffee or whatever it is, and <laughs> let's get right into it. So the thing is, OSI model actually serves like it's like a roadmap, you know, like that map that would help you understand how data flows through a network. So what it is, you just think of it like a foundation of networking knowledge, which will help you unravel the intricacies of communication between devices. So just imagine the OSI model like a stack of seven layers. And each of these stack of seven layers, just like in this picture that you can see here, just imagine this stack of seven layers are actually responsible for something for very specific, a very specific aspect of network communication. So as you can see from this diagram here, so from physical connections to application level data exchange, the OSI model actually does it all. So physical connections, application level, data exchange, like everything. And what we're going to do is we're going to have to break down these layers one after the other. We'll get deep into it. So now maybe just um, explain, just surface explanation, yes, just for the introduction. This is just like an introductory aspect. So I'll just explain the layers. So for the first layer, the layer one, like the physical layer, it's basically ju just like the term say it's just like it says physical layer it's going to tell you about the physical connections and electrical signals mostly about hardware like your cables and your switches so when you move up the stack we have the layer two which is the data link layer and layer two this data link layer actually ensures that reliable data is transferred or transfers data is transferred between directly connected devices so connect so as we go on i would actually go deep into it this is just like surface explanation so that i can just get this so if you don't really understand these terms now as i guess into each of them like one after the other you would be able to understand it so this detailing layer will just ensure that there's a reliable data transfer between directly connected devices handling tasks like error detection and correction so if you move up the layer one more layer you have like the network layer and what this network layer does is it helps it adds the concept of addressing and routing and in this network layer you just have data pa packets which are actually directed to their intended destination so wherever it is they're supposed to go to they go there across different networks so if we move up the layer one more time you see that we have the transport layer transport layer just simply manages end-to-end -end communication between devices and it actually establishes connections it breaks data into manageable chunks and actually ensures delivery reliability if we go up the layer one more time you have the session layer after the session layer you have the presentation layer and then you have the application layer and the thing about this other last three layers is three of them actually focus on application level interactions and these three layers they handle the task like session management so that's the session layer handles session management presentation layer handles data formatting and the application layer actually handles like the user interface so when you you get a better understanding of the OSI model, it will actually help you to understanding the OSI model will actually help you to gain insight into how networks operate and how you can troubleshoot issues more effectively, especially if you're a network administrator or somebody that is into networking or what have you. Plus, it's actually a very crucial step 
or a crucial stepping stone for you to, if you want to explore like the world of networking technology so for someone who is new into networking so to fully actually understand the concepts of the OSM model, it is actually essential to actually familiarize yourself with some common networking networking terms for some people that don't know. Um, so something like nodes. So what are nodes? Nodes refers to like physical electronic devices that are connected to a network, such as your computers, your printers, routers, and more. And when you when these nodes are properly configured, a node can actually send and receive information across the network. So nodes may be directly adjacent to each other, allowing for direct connection, or they actually may be intermediate nodes, like you have your switches or routers between them. And routers typically connect networks to the internet, while switches facilitate communication within a network. So if I have any detailed person here that is listening, another term you actually come across is like host. So what is a host? A host is actually a type of node that requires an IP address. So while all hosts are nodes, not all nodes are hosts. Then another term we can define is links. Links serve as connections between nodes in a network. And these links can be wired, such as your ethernet connections or wireless, like your Wi-Fi. Links can actually be point to point, connecting one node directly to another, or actually multi points, connecting one node to multiple others. So, this distinction is actually very important when you're considering the transmission of information as it determines whether communication is one to one or actually one to many. So, we have something else protocol. What's a protocol? A protocol is a set of mutually agreed upon rules that actually enable two nodes on a network to exchange data effectively. And this set of rules, you know, protocol, when this is something that's actually protocol, that's like means set of rules. And this set of rules actually just define the syntax, semantics, and synchronization of the communication process. Protocols can be implemented in hardware, software, or maybe even a combination of both. And while anyone can actually create a protocol, widely adopted protocols are often based on standards published by organizations like the Internet Engineering Task Force, IECF. Then another common term you would come across is network. So what is a network? A network is actually just a group of computers, printers, or any other devices that share data with each other and there are various types of networks that exist you have the LAN local area network one wide area network VPN virtual private network SAN satellite area network PAN private area network you get um and so many like that then we go on to topology you some that's something you also come across topology and what is this it just describes the arrangement of nodes and links within a network configuration. I'm sure you would have seen that different types of topology, different types of ways that nodes can be arranged. Some are like interconnected, some are meshed. You get just different types of ways these networks can be configured. And it's usually represented visually in network diagrams. So it depicts how different elements of a network are interconnected. And understanding this fundamental networking concepts, like including nodes, links, protocols, networks, and topology actually helps you lay the groundwork for you to understand more advanced topics like this OSI model and its seven layers of networking. So regardless of the scale or complexity of a network, these concepts form the backbone of a computer <laughs> network. So the OSI model is just a framework that consists of seven layers. Each of these layers is has a specific function and behavior within a network. And in simpler terms, these layers have, have, they have different levels and understanding these different levels within a network would actually help you understand it better. And what do you mean by layer? That different aspects of the networks functioning in organized groups ranging from the most tangible and physical to the more abstract and user oriented so there's something i use you know diff you can in order to understand this whole osi model there are so many mnemonics people can use i would just tell you mine how it's so easy for me to understand it so like if you would just tap me hey wake up what are the seven layers of the osi model I just use my mnemonics. Please do not transport salty pigs to America. So 
that's just it. Please do not. And each of these letters actually corresponds to the physical layer, data link, network transport, session, presentation, and application. So while certain topologies like Ethernet and Wi-Fi may seem to belong to specific layers, the reality is that many technologies overlap multiple layers in the OSI model. So when we start from layer one, which is the physical layer, this actually encompasses the tangible infrastructure of a network. And it, this tangible infrastructure, like I mentioned earlier, just means your computers, your printers, your routers, as well as the mechanics of how cables connect to these devices and the specification of various cable types and signal transmission methods. So at layer one, which is the smallest unit of transmittable digital information is the bits. So the smallest unit of transmittable digital information is the bits and it is represented as either zero or one and bits are synchronized and transmitted according to supported data rates and modes such as maybe simplex or duplex. And when you're troubleshooting problems at layer one, you just have to check. Um, it, it just generally involves checking for issues like damaged cables, malfunctioning hardware, or unplugged connections, or any problems here that can affect functionality of the higher layers. So for a, a network administrator or a network technician, a, um, a te network technician that maybe might be troubleshooting the person will just have to check for damaged cables you know there are usually steps to checking all this malfunction or troubleshooting problems with each of these layers so layer one just just know and remember the layer one serves as the foundation of network communication defining the physical infrastructure and specifications necessary for data transmission Understanding this role of the physical layer is really crucial so they can diagnose and resolve network issues very effectively. Yes. So now, if you've been able to make it this far, congratulations. So here's a fun fact. Deep sea communication cables facilitate data transmission globally, spanning vast distances between the ocean's surface. So let's move on to the second layer, the OSI layer 2, which is also known as the data link layer. And in this layer, we just learn how um, this fundamental layer just shows how data is transmitted between nodes within a network. So layer 2 actually serves as the bridge between the physical infrastructure and the logical communication process defining critical aspects of data transmission such as formatting flow control and error handling at the core layer 2 is actually responsible for determining how data is structured for transmission the amount of data that can flow between nodes and what actions to take when errors are detected along the way so let me break down these functions in in more in more digestible terms something you can really really understand so line discipline. So this aspect of layer two actually governs the rules for communication duration between nodes. Line discipline actually defines how long nodes can transmit data before relinquishing control to other nodes, before allowing like the other nodes to take control so they are transmitting data. And while this data is being transmitted, it's ensuring fair and efficient sharing of network resources. So another thing you need to understand is also flow control. In layer two, there's flow control. Layer two actually regulates the flow of data between nodes. And not only that, it helps to prevent overload and congestion by determining the optimal rate of data transmission. This helps maintain smooth communication and actually prevents data loss or corruption due to overwhelming network traffic. Another thing you need to understand about layer two is error control. What's error control? Error control, detecting and managing errors is actually very important for maintaining data integrity within a network. And layer two actually focuses on error detection, identifying anomalies such as electrical spikes or signal interference. While it's primarily detects errors, it also provides essential information to higher layers for subsequent error correction. So within this layer two, 
there are two distinct sublayers that actually further refine its functionality. So um, you have the Mac, MAC, Media Access Control. So the Media Access Control sublayer, which is with, which is inside the data link layer, what does it do? It just helps to assign unique hardware identification numbers, known as the Mac addresses. I'm sure you must have come across or maybe heard of Mac address before, but that is what um, the media access control does within the data link layer. And it assigns these MAC addresses to each device on the network. And these addresses assigned at the point of manufacturing facilitate the identification and communication between devices. MAC addresses residing on network interface cards are actually managed by switches within the network infrastructure. Then you also have the logical link control. This is another sub layer within the layer two. And this sub layer handles framing, addressing, and flow control within the network. It actually ensures the efficient transmission of data packets between nodes, adapting to the speed and characteristics of the network link, whether it be Ethernet or the Wi Fi. So the fundamental data with units within layer two is the frame consisting of a header, a body, and trailer. So what is this header? This header inside the layer two, it actually contains essential information such as source and destination MAC addresses. What does the body do? The body comprises of the actual data being transmitted between nodes. And the trailer includes error detection information to identify and address any transmission errors encountered. So if you're for anyone in the tech in, when a technician would actually be asked to troubleshoot a layer two problem or a network administrator or a networking engineer there are some certain types of problems they encounter in the layer two the data link layer and these type of problems when they're troubleshooting it mostly requires like vigilance for issues such as maybe there's an unsuccessful connection or there's an intermittent session failure or maybe the um, sometimes frame collisions and sometimes in addition to maybe challenges that are encountered at layer one because sometimes some problems that might occur at layer two the data leak layer might just be linked to something that also also been affected maybe a cable that has been that has not been connected properly in layer one so layer two actually just lays the groundwork for local area network communication, establishing protocols for efficient data transmission and error management. And when a not when you understand this data link layer and its intricacies, a network administrator can actually diagnose properly and resolve connectivity issues effectively, ensuring that there is ensuring seamless communication within the network infrastructure that is what the network administrator that is going to be that would have to troubleshoot maybe a layer two problem we just have to know how to do and once this person understands the whole layer to everything about the data link layer the person will be able to diagnose and actually resolve issues in connectivity properly and seamlessly and the person will be able to make sure that communication within network infrastructure is actually really really seamless so let's move on to layer three which is the network layer layer three which is also known as the network layer is like a traffic controller like the like traffic controller of the internet highway so the primary job of this layer three is to help facilitate communication between different networks using routers. Yeah, most most times, like if you've seen or if you've read in several books, most people just most anyone mentions or just talks about layer three, they are most likely saying, oh, anything that has to do with routers. So when people just say layer three, network layer, they just move layer three, network layer, routers. <laughs> And I hope as you're going along with this, you're still, you've maybe formed your own mnemonic because mine is, please do not transport salty pigs to America. <laughs> but you can form yours and you can understand yours. Imagine each network as like a distinct neighborhood and routers as the bridges connecting these neighborhoods. 
Layer 3 actually enables not just node-to-node -node communication within a network, but also network-to-network -network communication across multiple networks. Routers are the, they're like the heroes of Layer 3. Like, just like I mentioned earlier, when you just mentioned Layer 3, you just hear routers, like, routers layer three and they're responsible for directing data packets across various networks they actually connect to internet service providers keep track of network devices and actually determine the best paths for routing data packets in simple terms routers store all this information in something called the routing tables which are like maps guiding the data's journey through the internet highway now let's talk about data packets. What are data packets? Data packets are tiny vehicles that carry information across the internet. And each packet contains a frame and an IP address wrapper, which helps routers identify where the packets need to go. Think of it like, um, think of it like the address on an envelope. Do you get to the IP address wrapper, so where the, the packets is just the frame vehicles that will just carry information across the internet. But here's the catch. Layer 3 transmissions are best effort, meaning they simply send the traffic where it's supposed to go without guaranteeing delivery. That's where you have the layer 4 protocols that come in, but we'll actually talk about that later. But yes. Once a device actually connects to the internet, it's assigned an IP address, like a digital home address. And routers use these addresses to navigate and deliver data packets accurately. So this process is assisted by the address resolution protocol, ARP, which links IP addresses to MAC addresses, the physical addresses of the device. So let me simplify this key point data unit. So at layer three, we actually deal with data packets and each of these data packets contain a frame and essential IP addressing information. Think of them like letters with addresses written on them that are guiding them to their destination. Then you also have IP addresses. When a device actually connects to the internet, it's assigned an internet protocol address, like a unique home address. Um, such as maybe 172.16.254.1, which is an example of an IPv4 address. Or for an, an IPv6 address, you would have something like 2001.0db8.85a3.000.0001. It's a two e colon zero three seven zero colon seven three three four. That's how long an IPv6 address is. And routers actually use these addresses to navigate data packets through their routing tables. Then you have connectionless transmission. The are three transmissions are like a delivering mail without tracking. So they are sent without any guarantee of arrival. They only just send the packet. So they don't know whether it's arriving at its destination or not. Their job is just to simply direct the traffic to its intended destination. So just direct it. So whether it gets there or not, not their business. They have ARP protocol. So the address resolution protocol bridges the gap between IP and MAC addresses, ensuring that data packets are correctly routed. While technically part of layer two, like technically part of layer two, which is the network layer, is also closely associated with layer three operations because like ARP protocol, like we discussed in layer two, if you remember. So for cases where one will need to troubleshoot layer three, troubleshooting layer three issues is just essentially to check problems, check for problems with routers, whether there's an incorrect IP configuration or maybe faulty nodes. Sometimes command line tools like ping and trace are really handy for or net stars, depending on the whether you're using like a Windows or Mac or Linux. So you have to understand those command line tools. There are different command line tools for each of these platforms that could actually help in maybe diagnosing the IP address 
or if there's an incorrect IP configuration, yes, yeah, so or maybe there's a faulty or something wrong with the router. And the command line, some of these command line tools will actually really, really, I will be really, really handy for diagnosing these issues. So in a nutshell, layer three enables nodes to connect to the internet and communicate across different networks, ensuring seamless data transmission across the digital landscape. So before we continue, I'd like to suggest that you check out our Got Backup Cloud Service application for free. The link is in my about page. And what does the Got Backup Cloud Service do? It actually offers an affordable way to secure your personal data and so much more. Your support means the world to me. If this isn't your interest, no worries. The easiest way to help me bring more free tech content is by hitting that subscribe button. It ensures that this content actually reaches more viewers, allowing us to continue to provide valuable videos. Thank you so much for being here. Now let's continue. So now we have to go to layer four, OSI model layer four, which is the transport layer. And this actually goes into the details of connection, the connections between two nodes and how information flows between these nodes. Building upon the foundation, foundational function of layer two, if you remember, um, layer two is the data link layer, which and where we talked about nodes. So if we build upon this function of layer two data link layer where there's transportation or transmission of data and how they flow between nodes, including line discipline, flow control and error control. Layer 4 actually adds further complexity to the data transmission process. So one of the primary responsibilities of Layer 4 is actually data packet segmentation, which involves breaking down data packets into smaller segments for transmission over the network. So unlike Layer 3, Layer 4 also possesses an understanding of the entire message. So you know, remember we said Layer two, layer three is the networking layer, which involves just the flow and everything that's to it, how the data is transported, not getting to their destination, but transported. And unlike that, layer three, layer four actually also possesses an understanding of the entire message. So it's not just individual data packets. And this comprehension actually enables layer four to manage network congestion by regulating the flow of packets and ensuring they are not all sent simultaneously. So there is actually a flow. The data units within layer four, which are known as the data packets, come under different names depending on the protocol that is used. So remember we talked about protocol, which is like set of rules. So for um, a protocol is like TCP, which means transmission control protocol. Data packets are referred to as packets. So while for then there's UDP, user data, user datagram protocol, these are called datagrams. However, for simplicity, we'll use the term data packets instead of saying UDP or, or TCP throughout this discussion here. So TCP and UDP, there are two prominent protocols that operate within the layer four. So TCP is a connection of oriented protocol and taxi prioritizes data integrity over speed. What it does is, is that it establishes a connection with the destination node requiring a handshake to confirm data transmission. So TCP ensures that packets are delivered in the correct order and requests trans retransmission if necessary to maintain that data integrity. On the other hand, UDP which is a connectionless protocol, prioritizes speed over data integrity. So unlike TCP, UDP does not require a handshake, it allowing for faster data transmission. However, UDP does not guarantee that there's going to be a delivery or even ensure that the packets are received in the correct order. So both TCP and UDP, they communicate with specific ports 
on network devices identified by their IP addresses. The combination of the IP address and port number forms a socket, which facilitates communication between nodes. So in cases where a network administrator or a network technician, whether tier one or tier two, would need to perform any form of troubleshooting on layer four, these layer four issues would have to, they would have to learn to identify and address various problems such as blocked ports, firewall configurations, and quality of service settings that may actually impact traffic prioritize, prioritization. So, not only know what I've been saying concerning this layer four, which is a transport layer, is that it's a very important role when it comes to end to end message transmission by segmenting messages into data packets. So through protocols like TCP and UDP, layer 4 actually supports both connection-oriented and connectionless communication and ensures that efficient and reliable data transfer occurs across networks. <laughs> so now let's move on to layer 5. I hope you enjoyed this because I am really getting so much from it. So now layer 5 has to do with the session layer. If you remember, please do not transport salty pigs to America. So that's salty. The S and the salty refers to session. For me, it's always so easy for me to remember. Well, yeah, let's move on. So layer five, which is a session layer, is um, responsible for establishing, maintaining, and terminating sessions between network applications so what do i say establishing that's creating maintaining and that's and terminating ending sessions between network applications so unlike layer four which is a transport layer that actually focuses on data transmission between nodes that's communication between data between nodes what layer five does as a session layer is that it operates at a higher level and it allows connections between specific end user applications so a session in this context like refers to a mutually agreed upon connection between two network applications so unlike nodes which are ad which were addressed in the previous layers layer five abstracts away the concept of nodes so there is no using of you nodes are not applied in this layer five section and instead what we focus on in the layer five is session layer is on establishing connections between individual applications so there are two key concepts to understand at the session layer which are the client server model and the request response model so in the client server model the application requesting information is termed the client so the person, the application that actually asks for the information is the client. Whereas the application that provides the requested information, so the one that responds to the requested information is actually known as the server. And throughout a session, there is a continuous exchange of requests. So the client um, request information and the server provides. So there's just throughout the session layer, there's just a continuous exchange of requests between the client and the server and exchange of requests and responses between the client and the server applications. Sessions may actually vary in duration, which can range from brief interactions to long lasting connections. However, Sessions can also encounter failures leading to issues such as disconnections or even time out. Depending on the protocol and hardware involved, various failure resolutions processes may be initiated. So additionally, sessions may support different modes of communication, including simplex, half duplex or full duplex. Protocols that operate within layer 5 include Network basic input output system, that's the NetBIOS, and remote procedure call protocol, that's RPC, amongst the many other protocols. And these protocols facilitate the establishment and management of sessions between network applications. 
So other popular session layer protocols also include ADSP, which is Apple Talk Data Stream Protocol. You have ASP, Apple Talk Session Protocol. You have the ISNS, Internet Storage Name Service. You have L2F Layer 2 Forwarding Protocol. You have the PAP, Password Authentication Protocol. You have the PPTP, Points to Point Tunneling Protocol. You have the RTCP, Real-Time Transport Control Protocol. You have the SMPP, Short Message Peer-to-Peer. -peer. You have SCP, Session Control Protocol. You have the SOX, the SOX Internet Protocol. That's um, Then you have the ZIP, Zone Information Protocol. And for the purpose of this recording, I'll just end with SDP. There are, there are quite a number of them. So many other lights. ISOSB, SDP, which is um, Socket Direct Protocol. So an example of a session layer protocol is the OSI Protocol Suite Session Layer Protocol, also known as X.225 or ISO A327. In the case of a connection loss, this, this protocol actually may try to recover the connection. And if a connection is not used for a long period, the session layer protocol may close it and reopen it. It actually provides for either full duplex or half duplex operation and provides synchronization points in the stream of exchange messages. So as we move beyond layer 5 and progress higher up the OSI model, the focus shifts towards establishing connections with end-user applications and presenting data to users. So when a, in cases where you have to troubleshoot layer 5 or layer 5 troubleshooting issues, it's actually essential to address problems such as severe server unavailability and this occurs when the server which hosts the requested information or service is actually not accessible so this could be due to various reasons such as maybe there's a hardware failure a network congestion or even misconfigurations and identifying the root cause of server unavailability is actually essential for restoring connectivity and ensuring uninterrupted service for the end user then you also have incorrect server configurations, which can also pose like significant challenges at layer 5. This can actually involve misconfigured settings related to server protocols, authentication mechanisms, or access controls. And in such cases, troubleshooting efforts should actually focus on rectifying the configuration errors and aligning server settings with the intended functionality. Additionally, session failures such as disconnections or timeouts can disrupt the flow of data between clients and server applications. Disconnections occur when the session is abruptly terminated, often due to network issues or server-side failures. Timeouts, on the other hand, occur when there is actually prolonged delay in receiving a response from the server, leading to the termination of the session. So to address these session-related issues, the troubleshooting efforts may actually involve analyzing the network traffic, reviewing server logs, and conducting diagnostic tests to pinpoint the underlying issues. And by systematically identifying and resolving problems at layer 5, a network administrator can actually ensure the smooth functioning of end-user applications and optimize the overall performance of the network. So in all... The layer 5, the session layer, actually plays, plays a very important role in managing connections between network applications by initiating, maintaining, and terminating sessions. Layer 5 actually facilitates communication between clients and server applications and ensures smooth and reliable data exchange within the network. I would also add that it provides the mechanisms for opening, closing, and managing a session between end-user application processes. For example, maybe a semi-permanent dialogue. Communication sessions consist of requests and responses that occur between applications. These session layer services are usually commonly used in application environments that make use of remote procedure calls. Now, moving on to layer 6, which is the presentation layer and this presentation layer is responsible for handling data formatting tasks such as your character encoding conversions and encryptions 
This layer ensures that data is properly formatted and encrypted before it is passed on to the end user application operating at layer 7. So in this layer 6, the operating system hosting the end user application typically plays a role in executing these processes. However, it's important to know that not all network protocols implement functionality at this layer. So one of the primary functions of layer six is to ensure that the data presented to end user application can be consumed effectively and displayed correctly. So to achieve this, layer six actually employs various data formatting methods, which includes the American standard code for information interchange, and this widely used 7-bit encoding method is standard for character encoding. And it includes a superset called ISO 88591, which encompasses most characters used in Western European languages. Then we also have the extended binary coded decimal interchange code, EBCDIC, which, is which was developed by IBM for mainframe usage. This EDCDIC is another character encoding method. However, it is incompatible with other encoding methods. Then you have another one, the Unicode. Unicode also supports character encoding using 32, 16, or 8-bit characters and aims to accommodate all written alphabets. So encryption protocols such as SSL, which is Secure Socket Layer, or TLS, Transport layer security, they all operate within the layer 6. The presentation layer is usually composed of two sub-layers, which are the case, that's common application service elements, and the SIS, the specific application service element. So under the common application service element, you have the AS, ACSE, that's Association Control Service Element, the roles, the remote operation service elements, the CCR, the commitment, concurrency, and recovery, and you have the RTSC, the reliable transfer service element. Then under the SASE, SA, SAS, or SAS, however you want to call it, for easy remembrance, you have the FTAM, that's the File Transfer Access and Manager, the VT, the Virtual Terminal, MOTIS, MOTI is as the Message Oriented Text Interchange Standard, CMIP, Common Management Information Protocol, JTM, Job Transfer and Manipulation, MMS, Manufacturing Message Messaging Service, RDA, Remote Database Access, and DTP, Distributed Transaction Processing. Encryption is typically done at this presentation layer, although it can also be done on the application, session, transport, or network layers, and each having their own advantages and disadvantages. Decryption is also handled at this presentation layer. For example, maybe when somebody wants to log into like a bank account site, the presentation layer will actually decrypt the data as it is received. Another example is maybe representing structure, which is normally standardized at this level often by using the xml as well as simple pieces of data like strings or more complicated things are standardized in this layer so two common examples are objects in object-oriented programming and the exact way that streaming video is transmitted so like i mentioned earlier the encryption protocols such as the ssl or tls actually operate in layer six and these protocols play an important role in securing transmitted data by providing authentication and encryption for nodes on the network tls being the successor to ssl actually offers enhanced security features when dealing with layer six issues which pertain to presentation layer of the osi model it's actually very important to focus on resolving challenges related to data formatting, character encoding, and encryption. At this layer, data is actually prepared for transmission and presentation to end users, ensuring compatibility and readability across different systems and applications. One common problem that network administrators may encounter is the presence of non-existent or corrupted drivers. So these drivers facilitate communication between the operating system and hardware devices, allowing for the proper interpretation and rendering of data. 
when drivers are missing or corrupted, it can actually lead to compatibility issues, malfunctioning devices, and ultimately disruption in data presentation. So for troubleshooting efforts can actually involve the, um, the network administrator actually identifying and reinstalling the necessary drivers, updating firmware, or resolving conflicts between hardware components. Another critical aspect to consider at layer 6 is actually ensuring correct user access levels in the operating system. User access levels dictate the permissions and privileges granted to individual users or groups governing their ability to interact with system resources and perform various actions. Incorrect user access levels can result in security vulnerabilities, unauthorized access to sensitive data, and potential system breaches. Troubleshooting may actually involve reviewing and adjusting user permissions, implementing access control policies, and conducting security audits to identify and mitigate risk. So when a network administrator gets to address these layer 6 issues effectively, the person can ensure seamless data presentation, enhance system security, and actually optimize the overall performance of the network. Additionally, proactive measures such as maybe regular driver updates, user access management, and security training can actually help to prevent these similar issues from occurring in the future, contributing to a more robust and resilient network infrastructure. And lastly, layer 6, the presentation layer, focuses on data formatting and encryption to ensure seamless communication between end-user applications. And by standardizing character encoding and pl implementing encryption protocols, layer 6 is actually an important role, plays a very important role in securing and presenting data within the network. So now we move on to the final layer, which is the application layer. The application layer, also known as layer 7, serves as the top of the OSI model, being the layer that actually directly interacts with end user applications and provides essential services to support their functionality. So in simpler terms, this is the layer where the applications talk to the network communicate communicate with the network yeah as the name suggests the application layer caters to the needs of various end user applications including software programs installed on operating systems like web browsers for example you know you have the firefox google chrome and the likes microsoft edge and you have like word processing software maybe the microsoft word google docs and so many others. Applications actually often perform specialized networking tasks behind the scenes and they rely on specific services offered by layer 7 to function effectively. So for instance, like email programs are designed to operate over networks and utilize email protocols, which are actually part of layer 7. Additionally, applications, applications control user interactions, including security checks, such as, you know, multi-factor authentication or even user identification, initiation of data exchange and more. Just These are just applications. There are several well-known protocols that operate at the application layer and each of them serve distinct functions. So some of the protocols, popular application layer protocols include, you have 9P, Plan 9 for Bell Labs Distributed File System Protocol, you have AFP, Apple Filing Protocol. You have Atom Publishing Protocol. You have BEEP, B-E-E-P. That's Block Extensible Exchange Protocol. You have the Bitcoin Digital Currency. You have the BitTorrent, Peer-to-Peer File Sharing. You have CFDP, Coherent File Distribution Protocol. You have DDS, the Data Distribution Service. You have the eDonkey, Classic File Sharing Protocol. You have the ENRP, Endpoint Handle Space Redundancy Protocol, the Fast Track File Sharing known as the CASA. You have the Finger, User Information Protocol. You have the GUFAR, G O P H E R, that's GUFAR Protocol. You have HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, which is a very popular one. You have the IRCP, Internet Relay Chat Protocol, LDP, Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. 
LPD line printer daemon protocol. You have the NFS network file system, NIS network information service, NNTP network news transfer protocol. You have the NTP network time protocol. You have the OSCAR AOL instant messenger protocol. You have the RDP remote desktop protocol, RIP routing information protocol, RPC remote procedure call. They have the RTP real time transport protocol. We have the SAP session announcement protocol, SDP session description protocol, SMB server message block, SMTP simple mail transfer protocol, SNTP simple network time protocol, the SSH the secure shell. The SSMS, Secure SMS Messaging Protocol, the TCAP, Transaction Capabilities Application Part, the TOR, Anonymity Network, the TSP, Timestamp Protocol, we have the XMPP, Extensible Messaging and Presence Protocol, and so much more actually. While these protocols actually vary in their operations, and purposes they actually collectively facilitate the transmission and exchange of information over the network. So when we look at um, troubleshooting in layer seven, when you're dealing when dealing with um when tackling like layer seven issues, which actually relates to application layers of the OSI model, it's very important to focus on resolving challenges that directly impact end user applications and their functionality so at this layer applications interact with users providing access to various network services and facilitating communication between different systems so one common problem encountered when troubleshooting layer 7 issues is incorrectly configured software applications. So some software applications rely on combination of settings, configurations, and protocols to function properly within the network environment. And misconfigurations can lead to disruption in service, rendering these applications inaccessible or even causing them to behave unexpectedly. So troubleshooting efforts may involve reviewing these application settings, verifying the network configurations, and even adjusting parameters to ensure there's compatibility and optimal performance. User errors represent another significant concern at layer 7. So despite the sophistication of modern software applications, users may inadvertently perform actions that disrupt normal operations or even compromise system security. Examples of user errors include maybe entering incorrect login credentials or even mis misinterpreting application prompts or unintentionally modifying critical settings. So troubleshooting efforts can actually include just educating users about the best practices on what to do, how to do it, how to perform a task, providing actually clear instructions and guidelines and even implementing safeguards to prevent common mistakes. So once a network administrator learns to address these layer seven issues effectively, they can just ensure that this will just ensure that there's reliability, availability, and security of critical applications and services. Additionally, proactive measures such as user training, regular software updates, and even monitoring of anomalous behaviors can actually help to mitigate the impact of potential issues and maintain the integrity of the network infrastructure. Finally, the application layer acts as a bridge between the end user applications and the underlying network infrastructure, providing essential services and functionality required for seamless communication and interaction. So all in all, we've been able to establish that the OSI model provides a comprehensive framework for understanding how data is transmitted and exchanged across computer networks. So from layer one to layer seven, we've also talked about the mnemonics, which is please, well, my mnemonics, you can actually modify yours and do yours the way you want it. You can just pick maybe words or sentences or a sentence that resonates with you, something you that would make you remember each of these layers 
by yourself. Mine is please do not transport salty pigs to America, which helps me to identify the physical layer, the data layer, the network layer, the transport layer, the session layer, presentation layer, and the application layer. So from layer one to layer seven, each layer actually plays a role, plays their important role in ensuring the smooth flow of information from the physical transmission of bits at layer one to the application specific services provided at layer seven. So layer one, the physical layer deals with the actual transmission of data over physical mediums like cables and wireless signals. Layer two, the data link layer focuses on data framing error detection and media access control. Layer three, the network layer handles routing and forwarding of data packets between different networks. Layer four, the transport layer manages end-to-end -end communication and ensures reliable delivery of data. Layer five, the session layer enables, maintains and terminates sessions between network applications. Layer six, the presentation layer is responsible for data formatting, character encoding and encryption and finally layer seven the application layer supports end user applications by providing services like file transfer email and even web browsing so once you understand this and you know their functions and you know the interactions of each of these osi layer models if you are working towards becoming a network administrator or even just for knowledge purposes, this can just help you effectively troubleshoot issues and optimize network performance and even ensure the, sec ensure the secure and efficient transmission of data across complex computer networks. So thank you so much for being part of today's exploration into the OSI model. <laughs> Simplified, I hope you're able to gain so much insights um understanding this is really crucial for you so and i trust you've gained valuable insights whether you're gearing up for your day or even just carrying on with your routine i want to express my gratitude if you found this content really enriching just consider exploring our got backup cloud service application it's accessible through the link in my about page you can actually try it out for free and what we do is we offer an affordable solution to protect your personal data and more. So your support means a lot and means the world to me. So check it out. But if this doesn't align with your needs, no problem. Just simply hit that subscribe button. It goes a long way in helping me deliver more free tech content to the world. Your support fuels my ability to create informative videos. Thank you once again. And have a fantastic rest of your day. Talk to you soon. Bye for now.